The stage between America's two baseball sweethearts has been set for a chance to play for the World Series. Three years and one day since Chris Sale delivered a first pitch ball to George Springer in the most recent postseason matchup between these two teams. One is no stranger to LCS play. One vastly exceeded preseason expectations to get here. This is what baseball is all about. We've got lots to talk about on this rare baseball edition of Mass Holes with Mike's. We decided to forego the traditional uh, NFL picks episode this week to talk about the Red Sox and the Astros ALCS matchup. I'm Jordan Leandri, joined as always by Jeremy Guerin and Kyle Bray. Filling in for Jacqueline Galvin is my fellow advanced stats nerd, Sean Facey. Thank you for joining uh, all of us tonight, Sean. Uh, okay, so before we get into all the fun stuff with how these two teams match up, I must pose the question, given where the Red Sox team was projected to finish in spring training, does the result of this series change you guys' opinion of how the season turned out? And I'm going to start that with Kyle. Oh, boy. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, I would say win or lose, it's not really going to affect my opinion of it that much, only because... I think expectations for this team were so low. I mean, I've talked about it with you guys, Sean, a lot because Sean and I live together. How's it going up there, neighbor? Um, <laughs> because my expectations for the Red Sox this year, not expectations, my hope was I just want them to be entertaining. I just want to be able to watch them and not want to pull my hair out, which for the, for the first part of the season was the case. You could do that. The second half of the season was not so much. A lot of hair was pulled out on my part. But now that they're back in the playoffs, they're playing fun, exciting baseball. They beat the Yankees, which was the only thing I needed them to do this year. The only thing they needed to do was win the wild card game for me this year. The fact that they beat the Rays was a cherry on top. After game one, I didn't think they had a prayer. Now, the fa- now that they're in the ALCS, they're facing an absolute juggernaut uh, Astros team. We are a little bit dinged up now, but they're still pretty good, and they've pretty much owned the Red Sox the whole year. So, I mean, I, even if they lose, I still would see it pretty much as a success just because, like, I mean... Who, who the hell thought they were going to go this far? No one did. Their over-under was set at, like, 80, and everyone was saying, hammer the under. Like, no one thought this was going to happen. Um, yeah. I will still be disappointed if they lose, only because I can imagine if they end up losing, it's going to be because of a lot of the issues that they did not address in the middle of the season, kind of when their slip started happening. You know, probably some poor managerial decisions or not having enough, like, good enough players to fit certain roles. Um, where, you know, certainly that team was not built for that and those weren't their expectations. But at the same time, when they were leading the division, like, all right, you have to kind of think like, all right, we're leading the division now. Like we need to start kind of approaching the season in a little bit of a different way. Granted, they didn't necessarily have to do that, but as a fan, that's what I would have wanted to see them do. Um, and if they win, good on it. Let chaos reign. What do I care? It's going to be a great season. Even if they lose in the World Series, that would stink because I've never seen them lose in the World Series. But at the yeah. same time, like, if this team went to the World Series, like, what the hell? <laughs> Why not? Why not us? <laughs> It'd be absolutely <laughs> hilarious given the the fact that this, the expectations were so low. I mean, maybe, I mean, some people were incredibly optimistic about them, had them winning 87 to 90 games. But I personally, was it 82 at 80? That was my prediction in spring training, and that completely, I completely jumped up to 90 wins after like their their winning streak after getting swept by Baltimore. Um, I don't think my opinion will change of this team, regardless of the result of this series. Now, obviously, if chaos ensues and they beat Houston, which is possible now that Lance McCullers may be out for the entire series, at least the first two games, um, according to reports today. Um, But we haven't, all I wanted this season was to see them play meaningful baseball in September. And that was something we hadn't seen since 2018. We haven't really seen any meaningful games post trade deadline since 2018 either, because that that series against the Yankees was, I believe, right at the end of July, where they won eight of 11. They won those first three games against the Yankees, and then Sale got shelled, and they lost seven straight. And basically, the season was over at that point. Uh, they've delivered and then some this season, way, way beyond my expectations. They got 90 wins, postseason berth, wild card win over the Yankees, no less, who were projected to be in a lot of a lot of preseason predictions, the AL representative in the World Series, and then an LDS win over the Rays, who, which is the team that the Red Sox plucked time bloom from, which is just insane. Like I said after, I think, game one or in the middle of game two, Heim Bloom can't lose in this series. He either loses to the team that he helped build or he beats the team he helped build with a team that he built. I mean, there's some guys there from Dombrowski's tenure, but still. And even some from Charrington's tenure still with uh, with guys like Bogarts. But 
eighth ranked offense in terms of non pitcher wins above uh, weighted runs created plus at 107. The rotation was sixth in FIP, tied for eighth in X FIP, and tenth in skill interactive ERA. They were much better than I think anybody projected them to be, especially since you know no bets, no Benintendi, no Bradley, and then on top of that, the rotation sale didn't come back till August. Uh, at this point, it's all gravy to me, Sean. Oh, I'm on, I'm in the same boat. I mean, this is they're playing with house money right now. Yeah. Like, I was again, Jordan. You and I were on the same page uh, when we did that preseason podcast. I had the Sox at 83 and 79. I w- actually went back and looked at that Google Doc, and I had the Yankees winning the World Series. And now here we are. The Red Sox beat the Yankees, like we just talked about, on route to the ALDS, where they bounced a 100 win raised team. They are the last team standing from the AL East, a team that had four team or a division that had four teams win 90 plus games. And they're competing with the Astros for a berth in the World Series. I don't think it gets much better than that, considering where, how you came into the season with Kike Hernandez and Hunter Renfro essentially being your two big additions and Garrett Richards. <laughs> um, I, I really, you know, I haven't, I mean, I loved the 2018 team. I loved 2013. Like, I've loved a lot of Red Sox teams, but this one just feels special in some way in that they had so little pressure on them coming into the season. And now that they're here, they're just like the Schwarber fist pump in game three after he, after the error. One of the funniest <laughs> things I've ever seen on a baseball field. <laughs> Schwarber, Dude, it happened Schwarber's in the playoffs. Love in the postseason. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. The best, I think the best part about that is, is Arroyo and Renfro getting behind him also pumping yes, their fist. They were, they were, they were just as excited about it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's just kind of like, that's the epitome of this team. That's who they are. They just love playing baseball. They're having a good time. They know that, you know, a lot of people didn't expect them to be here. Um, And they're having fun with it. And the way I see it is, as fans, we should have fun with it, too. If they lose, so be it. They made it further than they were supposed to go anyway. And they lost to an Astros team that is, for all intents and purposes, one of the best teams we've, like, one of the best, I don't want to call it a dynasty quite yet, but, like, especially with the cheating scandal, but, like, my personal opinion on it, whatever. Point being, the Astros have been a very good team for a very long time now. As we discussed, five ALCS appearances in a row. They're gunning for what? Their third World Series appearance in five years? To make it to this point and to be between it's between the Red Sox and the Astros again, it's just incredible to me. And I'm no matter what ha- they could I saw a tweet that was like they could lose every game this series two hundred to nothing, and I would still be happy with how this team performed. For sure. And I know I intentionally had you go last, Jeremy, because I remember when we talked about it in the chat, you were talking about how your expectations have changed after the way that they have gotten to the LCS. And you said that your opinion may be a little different. And that's why I wanted to let you go last and kind of, you know, put a bow on this uh, on this topic. Yeah. So I'm looking at this team and I think it's fair to say, as the other three have, they have far surpassed any expectations that we had of them preseason. But that doesn't mean that I didn't change my expectations for them around midway through the season. Um, Trade deadline conversations, I would often be in at work at 6 in the morning, and I would wait until one of you fools would wake up and I could text you about who they should try and acquire at the trade deadline. More often than not, it was Sean. Um, We would be going... (laughs) And kind of debating these guys. And I said, you know what? you got to go and get somebody because this team is worthy of investment. I think they can make the World Series. And, in fact, they probably should win it if they come up against a team not named the Dodgers. Uh, fast forward to October at the date of recording 14th. And that is still true. This team was worthy of investment. This team still could win the World Series. And the team that I wouldn't be upset if they lost to it would still be the Dodgers because they are still that wagon. Um But I think that the trade deadline point that Kyle brought up was a fair one. Yes, they did make an investment. Yes, some of these guys did turn it around a little bit, especially, most notably, Robles down the stretch was borderline unhittable. But I will say... I think if I'm in, if I was in the Red Sox locker room, part of the reason that they had that terrible slide after the trade deadline, throughout the majority of August and even the beginning half of September, was probably because they looked at these guys and said, "Are you going to give me more than just Kyle Schwarber, a guy who does still mess up that defense a little bit because he's not the best defender and he's playing a position that he never had before in first base?" I think it's a fair criticism of Hyam Bloom to say maybe you could have gone in a little bit more and gotten one of these guys. Now I'm not asking them to go give up a Cassius because he is untouchable. I'm not asking them to go and give up 
of one of these top 10 prospects in the in the uh, system. Maybe I'll say top seven. But those eight, nine, ten guys, I would have been okay with them giving up because at the end of the day, you are still the Boston Red Sox. And that this is what I'm interested to see them going forward in. And I know we're going to get into grades afterwards, so I'm going to save it for that. But uh, I don't. I'm not going to be as upset if they lose this series as opposed to like 2018. But I will probably be the most upset of the four of us because I believe the moment that you get to this point, the moment you get to the final four teams remaining, and Boston Sports has now had 30 semifinal, if you will, appearances, whether that be the conference finals in hockey and uh, basketball, you got the ALCS, and then the AFC Championship game, 30 since 2000. That's insane for the four major teams. But once you get here, you should be gunning to win, and it's not gravy. Because you got here for a reason. You deserve to be here, in my opinion. You were better than the Rays in this last series. You'd been better than the Yankees all year long. I'm happy that the Astros are here because they should be the litmus test for this team. Go and beat them. I do think it's funny because, uh, really quickly before Kyle goes, I saw I just jumped in and cut him <laughs> off. But it's funny because I listened to you know some of our old shows back when we it was the original three of us. And it was just uh, myself, Jeremy, and Sean. This, we had this exact conversation in 2018, and you two were on the on the boat on the boat of it being gravy. You were on the gravy boat, if you will. Yeah. I man, what an I, idiot I was. <laughs> I was saying what Jeremy just said, and I was like, "You're here. You were the best team in baseball all season. Obviously, this year they they weren't, um, but they were still obviously in the conversation. They wouldn't have made the playoffs." And I thought it's Boston. It's World Series or bust. And you guys were both on the on. Um, you know, saying that it was gravy at this the point. It's kind of train. interesting. The gravy train. It was. It was. It's kind of interesting to see how you know. I mean, I know Sean's still saying it's gravy, but how Jeremy and I kind of flip flopped on yep. that, Kyle. Oh, I was just gonna say I like Jeremy's point saying that the the Astros are the litmus test because that's what I was saying early on in the season when the Sox were playing so well, and I'm sure you guys were as well. But in my conversations, I was having with other people being like. The reason why I was excited, like I was like, I think this team's good. I think they'll be a playoff team, but I don't think they're a World Series team because every time they faced the Astros, they just looked completely lost. They looked like they couldn't do anything against them. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit later, but um, yeah, I just I, I I that was that was that was my take early on in the season. Yeah, I mean it it definitely, especially since now you have Sale. You didn't when you faced them those two series prior. You have Sale. You know, and it, you it, started it, Martin Perez. Yeah, you started Martin <laughs> Perez, and, and the whole thing is at that time, you know, Matt Barnes was an all, at an all star level. Adam Ottavino was a very productive, you know, setup man in that role, and Garrett Whitlock was more of a, you know, you use him every two or three days for two or three innings, usually as a bolt guy behind someone like Pavetta or Garrett Richards or even Perez. And now Barnes is borderline unusable. Adam Ottavino is borderline unusable. I shouldn't say borderline for both of them; they pretty much are. I mean. Let's face it, Ottavino was horrible, had been horrible since he very rudely wished Shohei Otani a happy birthday in L.A. Matt Barnes has been awful since he gave up that home run to George Springer in the beginning of August. And now Garrett Whitlock and Hansel Robles. If I told you that in March, that the Red Sox would be in a position to win the American League pennant and play for the World Series, and their two best relievers are Hansel Robles, who wasn't even rostered, and a Rule 5 guy, Garrett Whitlock, that cost you I would have asked grand. you, what is a Hansel Robles? Exactly. And, and, <laughs> exactly. And, and what went horribly wrong? Yeah, seriously. Some, something like, named a Hansel Robles will be coming in. Where's yeah, Gretel? <laughs> seriously, though, and we... I will say, you though, would if have you told crazy. me... If you told me post trade deadline that was the case, I would have not. I would have been bewildered about Robles, but I would have not been surprised about Whitlock. Yeah, Whitlock great. had been. Mm. Whitlock had kind of pitched himself into that role, but still in spring training, I, you're like those two. I mean, you had you have Barnes, you have Ottavino, you have you know Darwin's and Hernandez, you have Josh Taylor, but Whitlock and Hansel Robles. Me and one of my closest friends were like so early in on the Whitlock train, like in the beginning of the season, we're like, wait, no, this guy. This guy's kind of nasty, and I'm very yeah. happy that it's it's lasted this long and has we've been proven right. I guess we didn't really have any doubters, but you know we still won. It's hilarious because I remember when I did my my spring training like roster projection, I completely forgot about Garrett Whitlock. Like he was just he just never crossed my mind. I'm like rule five guy. He's just completely not part of it. And the funny thing is, is his best pitch has become his changeup, which was taught to him by none other than Matt freaking Andres. So it's like, what a what a bananas uh, road roller coaster this season has been. Do we have any other thoughts on you know the Red Sox season as it stands before we get into how these two teams stack up against each other? 
No? All right. So moving on, we are going to look at piece by piece. We're not going to look at defense. I mean, it's pretty obvious that the Red Sox have the disadvantage defensively. We saw it for well, the entire year, but especially in the second half. So we're going to look at rotation, bullpen, lineup, and manager. I will start this one with Jeremy because I had him go last in the last uh, last run of topics. We'll start with the rotation. Jeremy, who do you think has the advantage in this series? Oh, that's so hard, especially without if you're not going to count the bullpen. I almost have to go with the Red Sox because they have, in my opinion, the best playoff pitcher out of the bunch, and it's Evaldi. Uh, Greinke is close, obviously. McCullers, as you mentioned, not going to be here for the first two games of the series. But Evaldi is a weapon. And he has not only proven that he can pitch in the postseason, what's more important to me, he can pitch, he's proven that he can pitch in the postseason on the road, specifically in Houston. And I know a lot of these these Astros hitters are going to be gearing up to hit that 102 that he blew by Alex Bregman in the playoff game last year after Bregman kind of clowned him on social media. But... I think that the the Red Sox have the weapon of Evaldi. I'm upset that he's not going game one because if I was Alex Cora, I would pitch him games one, four, and seven. I would. Especially because it's been proven, at least in the Rays series, that the starter is not all is not always the most important guy. It's the second guy that comes in. But if you have a weapon like Evaldi that can go and pitch six innings and give your bullpen a break, you need that. And at the very least, he can give you a solid three in game seven before you can turn it over to other guys. So I think I'm going to take the Red Sox rotation in a slight, slight edge. Okay. Sean? I would... I think all those points are valid. I would only give the slight edge to Houston in the rotation just because of how, A, how their rotation performed against the Red Sox this year without McCullers, first of all. Red Sox never faced McCullers. So that's, for me, that's a non-factor that he's not on the, on the roster. The only difference there is that it kind of shortens things for them, but so be it. It's the playoffs. It, that happens anyway. Um, B, I watched Framber Valdez carve up the Red Sox in Houston this summer. Um, dude's a machine. I don't I don't know what I don't know what else to say other than that. Luis Garcia is very good. Granky is very good, future Hall of Famer. And honestly, you know, moving through the like moving through the rest of the rotation, it's not like they've got bumps. Like Jake Odorizzi wasn't great this year, but he wasn't terrible. Like And Urquidy's he's been good in the great. past. Exactly. And Urquidy's great. Urquidy's pitched in the postseason as well. Like, you know, all these guys have experience and they all have like some pretty lethal pitches, so as my, I love the Red Sox rotation, and I don't think it's that – I don't think it's, like, you know, miles behind Houston as it might have been, say, in, like, 2018. Um, but I will give a slight edge to the Astros in this one. Kyle? Yeah, I give the edge to the Astros only just because beyond – beyond Evaldi and Sale, I'm not as convinced in the rest of the Red Sox rotation. But also at the same time, even Evaldi and Sale, as great as they have been in the past and for some of them this year – Avaldi is still prone to if he doesn't start hot, like it's over. Like if if he gives up like two or three runs in the first like two innings, like he's in trouble. He does not recover well when he starts. Yeah, poorly. with the exception of game three. With yeah, the well, Rays. but that also helped because the Sox immediately responded. That's true. And the Sox, a lot of the times, and when Nate Avaldi's had a rough start, which happened actually against the Astros in one game I went to, the Sox just offense did not recover for him and they did not help him out. Um. Sale has, I, is he going to be able to go he, for he more looks than three innings right now? Is he, he going to be able to go cooked. for more than three innings? I have no idea. Uh, Pavetta, fine. Little Jekyll and Hyde. Sometimes he's great. Sometimes he's not. Erod looked really good. He shoved in game four, but he is not very consistent. And beyond that, like, I don't know, you know, like you're, you're probably not using anyone other than them for, I'd imagine. Yeah. And I would round this out. I'm going to pick the Red Sox to have the advantage in the rotation. I do think, um, I, I, I did two separate, you know, rotations in my mind. I think it's contingent on game four starter. It's either going to be Pavetta. I personally, and I'm kind of diving into the question I was going to ask after we did, we talked about the rotation. I would personally go Tanner Houck in game four. I would have him out of the bullpen as I would have him available out of the bullpen in either game one or two. If he pitches game one, you can't pitch in game two. So you can save him for game four. I think he should start. And I think you should use Pavetta as bulk behind him. Um, but I think the Red Sox held the edge with the guys I project to go be in their rotation versus the guys I project to be in the Astros rotation. I completely forgot about Urquidy. I put Granky and Odorizzi in the rotation myself. Um, I don't think Urquidy, and he's a solid pitcher. I just think the Red Sox are a little bit better. Um, if Sale truly figured out something in the bullpen, 
with his mechanics because I thought I thought there might have been a chance that he was not repeating his delivery. It's a very herky jerky motion as it is, and you spend 19 months away from you know a major league game. It's possible that will happen. Um, if he truly figured it out, you know, I-, I like the Red Sox chances. I think they own the advantage in the first two games, especially in the rotation. Uh, we'll quickly move on to – actually, I guess I'll ask that question now. Who would you guys start in game four? That's the big question because it's obviously going to be Sale, Ovaldi, then Erod. Who would you give game four to? Um, anyone can jump with that one. I'd probably give it to Pavetta just because he's been the most consistent of all the other ones and you're not probably not going to roll another one of those guys. Yeah, unless it's fair. unless it's unless they're down 3-0, I'd imagine that like psycho Native Aldi will be like pitch me. I don't care how many pitches <laughs> I threw. Seriously. Which in that case would be like, "All right man, go ahead." But if it's if they're not down um drop the knife. Yeah, seriously. If they're not down by that much, if they're not down 3-0, like I would give it to Pavetta. Okay, Sean. I mean, I'm kind of on the same page as you, Gordon. Um I th- I think Tanner Houck handles himself really well. Um in high pressure moments and i think that starting him is probably a good call because he'll keep the he'll keep the the vibe kind of low key if that makes sense for a playoff game um at least on defense like dude looks like he's been out there for 20 years every time he steps up steps up on the mat i'm not a big believer in like you know i'm not a gut guy mm-hmm. but like tanner Houck is one of those guys my gut just screams for it mm-hmm. um for sure. and i think pavetta has proven himself to be extremely useful out of the bullpen rather than starting um, you know, in the ALDS twice, he came through out of the bullpen. So I think I'm most comfortable with going with how, and if, you know, if things go south fast, then you've got the better right there because the dude's a bulldog and he'll eat innings for you if you need it. I yeah, honestly think either could serve as like an opener for game four. Yeah. Like yeah. both of them just, they just say you're going three innings four maybe. Yeah. I, exactly. I already, I already said go how, cause I'll let Jeremy wrap this one up. Contrary to Sean, as you can see on the Zoom screen, I am all gut. And I am going to be saying <laughs> that the guy, uh, the way I wanted to pair the pitching matchups is I want Sale and Hauk combined. I want Erod and Pavetta combined. I want Hauk out of the bullpen in games one and two, long in game one, short in game two if they need an inning, as Evaldi was used in the World Series. And I want Hauk to start in game four, Pavetta coming out of the pen first after Erod in game three. Pitching in game five, six, and seven. At least an inning apiece for Pavetta there. I know he's a starter, but he can go long relief if you need it. Him and Hauk uh, definitely got to be the swing guys in this series. For sure. And we'll go through the rest of this kind of rapid fire because I, I realize that we are we run on a little bit long with the first two topics. Uh, we'll just go right into the bullpen. I'll lead. I think Houston's bullpen is a lot better. It's a lot more uh, stable, I guess you could say. I mean, the Red Sox all-star closer. That kind of, inf- that kind of inflates their numbers and makes them look a lot better has been horrible since August. audavino has been bad. Your cause is Sal Moore and Darwin's and Hernandez. If they're on the roster, they both walk guys like crazy. So I don't have a lot of faith in the Red Sox bullpen. Now, if you had a starter into it, maybe, but I don't really have a lot of faith in it. Uh, Jeremy? It's got to be the Astros. They actually know their roles, so I'm going to go with Houston. Kyle? Yeah, I'm taking the Astros as well, and I'm actually going to – I'll probably elaborate on the Red Sox bullpen a little bit later, so I'll save that for then. Okay, and Sean? We're all on the same page here. I agree. Houston's bullpen is a lot deeper, a lot more stable. Yeah. Gotta go Houston. And then uh, on to the lineup, which I actually looked at the numbers on this. I'm not going to lead on it, but it's a lot closer than I thought it was overall with the guys that are going to actually be in the lineup. So you're not going to get, you know, numbers from Jose Iglesias or guys like that that played like 15, 20 games and really like had ridiculous runs or really bad runs. Jose so, uh, Iglesias, like, oh. who saved the Red Sox season? <laughs> Jose Iglesias' body <laughs> language saved the Red Sox. Um, Kyle, uh, Kyle, you can start. Um, I mean, it's got to be the Astros. I think they just have so much more quality talent and a little more consistent talent, I think. like Because like, the Sox, obviously, maybe on paper, might have a better roster, but at the same time, well, at least maybe in their lineup, not on a better roster, but... You know, guys like JD and and Xander have been so inconsistent, and they're normally supposed to be your guys that you can lean on in those situations. Like, who knows if Kike is going to be able to continue this play? If he can, the Sox are going to be fine. But I don't, I don't know if like you're going to be able to rely on these guys that are supposed to be your rocks in your lineup. So I'm going to take the Astros. Sean, I'm going to go with the Astros, but I'm kind of with you on this, Jordan. It's a lot closer than it might feel at first glance. Um, Boston's offense is like consistently like above average, but Houston just has that like next level star power with guys like Jordan, 
Kyle Tucker, Carlos Correa, Jose Altuve, like they can just up it to that next level when they really want to. And I think that's what gives them the edge. Yeah. I mean, their, their lineup, their seventh best hitter bats third. Like Alex yeah. Bregman is not a, a far from a bum. He's not, you know, what he was a couple years ago when he was an MVP candidate, but he is batting third for them. And he's the, probably their seventh best hitter in their lineup. Um, Kyle Tucker hits like eighth or seventh, and he's probably their second best hitter behind Jordan Alvarez. So it's, they can beat you at so many different levels. I'm going to take the Astros as well. That, their star power alone just beats the Red Sox star power. You know, you're kind of here in the LCS with guys that are really outperforming their true talent level, like Renfro and Kike, and even to an, a degree, Schwarber's never been this good. Um, with the Astros, there's just so much more consistency between, you know, just from year-to-year basis with the guys that they have. Jeremy? Houston, um, I can't see any guy that I would take against this Astros order outside of Avaldi and Whitlock. Lefty-righty, lefty-righty, all that, all that all the way through. Uh, Alvarez lengthens it out a lot and having to go the three batter minimum if you have to throw Austin Davis against any three sections any three batters in this Astros lineup I get scared yep for sure and lastly we'll just do it in one word manager Uh, we'll start with Jeremy Cora by a mile I don't believe in Dusty Baker in the postseason Cora has the minus touch so far in his Red Sox tenure in the playoffs I want to see it keep going so I can go nuts if uh, an Eduardo Nunez home run type of incident happens once again this dude for some whatever reason has the luck I believe in him all the way I want him to get re-upped after this year I think we all do at this point um yeah run it back and I need to see Houston going home early because of Alex Cora because that would be poetic yeah that was a very long word (laughs) <laughs> um i'm gonna just basically everything jeremy said cora is much better than dusty baker and i know kyle's mad because that's his reds guy but kyle, no no i'm just mad that jeremy somehow stole the analogy that i was going to make in my i've said it for a while but yeah. I, well because i was going to tell the story of when i was i was at that game and my dad i they were like oh now pinch hitting eduardo nunez and i'm just like what the hell, man? Like, what are we doing? Like, we're in a must-win situation. You're going to Nunez. And my dad looks at me and he goes, trust in Cora. And I go, okay. okay. <laughs> and then, that ball's in a ton. It's in the monster. And I'm like, I believe. So, yeah. Playoff Cora is just a totally other, be- is a totally different beast. Um, if only he could just be like that for 162 games. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sean, and then after you give yours, uh, you can just go right in and say what you g- would grade Cora for the season. All right, I only have one thing to say, and it's the quote that Garrett Whitlock gave after the ALDS. Alex Cora is a guy you'd run through a wall for. If he told me to run through that wall, I'd believe that he had something there to make sure it would fall for me. Nice. That's why I'm picking Alex Cora ahead of Dusty Baker. And this year, I mean, I'm a big Cora truther. Um, I know he had some missteps, which is why I will give him a B. Um because he wasn't quite, you know, like that A grade manager that, you know, he was kind of in 2018 where everything he did, like he was literally Midas Cora. Um, but you know what? He got, he gets the job done. The guys love him. And you know, as you can tell by the Whitlock quote, like they believe in him. And, you know, when, when he, when he steps into that clubhouse and has something to say, they listen. And this team is like, is one cohesive unit and they're going to live together and die together. And it's all because of him. So, Jeremy. He gets an A. He gets a higher grade than Bloom for me. I think he is the reason the Red Sox are here. Not so much Bloom. The guys play for him. Specifically, Bogarts and Devers. And I think those are the two guys that you absolutely need to you to play for you more than any other two players on this roster. And they do for him. He absolutely, absolutely deserves a multi-year extension. Bloom better give it to him. He is the reason that they're here, make no mistake about it. They believe in him. It's very hard for a manager to affect a game like a football head coach can. Basketball coaches can't do it. Hockey coaches, to a large degree, can't do it. Managers can't do it. Because football coaches have so much say in the game plan, as opposed to you just have to send the players out to play the game. Um... Cora is the one, one of the few exceptions where they will ratchet it up a level for him. I don't know why, but I'm not going to question it because he deserves all the praise he, he, he's gotten over the course of the year and probably more from the people who are giving him a lot of flack in August and September. 
Kyle. AKA like me and Jordan. Yeah. Um, I didn't say I'm that. Very you knee-jerk. said that. I didn't I'm say very, that. I'm very knee jerk. I every time I stabilize, oh, I, I am, understand I, Cora's the guy. I have been diagnosed <laughs> with knee jerk syndrome, man. Like you should have <laughs> you should have seen me texting during the Oklahoma Texas game. I texted my friend who was a Texas fan, GG, when it was fourteen nothing after a minute and twenty seconds. Uh, <laughs> um but for my grade, I I'm with Sean here, giving him a B. Um, I, I was definitely a little more critical of his like in season, you know, issues where he just, you know, he seemed like for when their losing streak was going on, he seemed like he just could not make a right decision at any turn. Like if they finally had something going right, he'd put in the wrong guy or he'd take out the wrong guy and then they'd lose. And then you'd be like, is his team ever going to win again? But I'm not going to get down on him too much because of everything that Jeremy and Sean just said. I mean, like he's just he just has the Midas touch. Like there's just something about him that the guys love. And I think that bringing him in, it's just, it shows like just an incredible amount of, you know, like strength in the way that he is as a coach. Because like, look at how they played under Ron Renneke. Like I'm sure Ron Renneke is a fine manager, like, you know, day in and day out, but he's not a guy. I think those guys wanted to go to war for. And Alex Cora is a type of, is a guy that you want to go to war for. And for even all of his missteps, you're right. He does bring value by just having that and knowing how to speak to the players. And that's why he was brought in instead of John Farrell, because John Farrell couldn't do that. John Farrell lucked his way into a World Series and then held on to his job because he kept being able to win enough games. Alex Cora brings you over that edge just because he can connect to the players in that way. Yeah, and to round this out, I'm in, in between all three of you. I, I had him at a B plus. I originally had him as, at a B, but when I was doing more thinking, I thought the way he navigated through that COVID outbreak, he did it to an, a T. He was like, listen, you know, we're not going to burn our best relievers trying to chase a win. You know, if we fall behind early, we're going to trust our offense to come back in the game. We're going to get other guys involved because we can't burn what we do have for relievers that are, you know, consistent, proven MLB commodities – trying to come back from down five to two in the fourth inning. We're just not going to do it. I thought he navigated that thing pretty much seamlessly. Um, And also, you know, the reasons you guys all said, you know, guys want to play for him. And it almost seems like to a degree, these players, they're not talking to fans when they're talking about how much they like to play for Cora. And this is going to get into like one of my final points I'm going to have when we finish the show later. Um, It feels like they're talking to potential future teammates like, listen, this dude, like, we run through a brick wall for him. This is a family environment. I think that there is, there's something more, like, between the lines. And I know I don't I don't necessarily like to overanalyze, you know, basic quotes and stuff like that. But I, it feels like they're talking to somebody that's not just in the media or one of us listening to them speak. Mookie they definitely, bets. <laughs> they're trying to bring Mookie <laughs> back. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, and I guess we'll transition right into that, and I'll give my Heim Bloom grade which was an A, a firm A, and I think the only reason it wasn't an A+, plus was because I thought they could have added another starter at the deadline. I was all over Alex Cobb. He ended up not being moved, so it's not the end of the world. But I thought they could have added one more arm. They didn't. It's not like I'm going to you know, crucify the guy over it, but at the end of the day, you know, he, he brought in Kike Hernandez. He brought in Renfro from nothing, and they ended up playing out of their minds for this team. And Renfro, I thought, was a little bit less surprising than Kike because I thought Renfro swing played beautifully at Fenway park with that monster. If the monster didn't exist, he would have probably hit 70 home runs at home this year. Um, there's just so many balls. He hit three quarters of the way up the wall on a screaming liner. And the only reason I didn't give him an eight plus outside of the deadline thinking he could have added one more starter was missing on Marcus Semyon was a big, that I, I mean, I wasn't high on Semyon going into the year, but if he added him to play second base on top of having Kike in center, I mean, it's easy to be to play Monday morning quarterback with that, but 45 home runs out of the second base position on top of elite defense, and he stays on the field. You know, you had so many issues with second base this season, and if Semyon could have been here to stabilize that on top of the power production, it would have been ridiculous. So, I mean, we're talking about maybe like a difference of a 96 to a 98 in terms of a grade if I had to base it out of 100. What, we're you're not over. a Jonathan Aruz guy? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, was, I was big on Jonathan Aruz last year. I even made memes of him with a crown on his head. I called him King Aruz, and I call him I call I him J3 <laughs> for a reason. But, I forgot um, about that. Yeah, we'll go, we'll go in reverse here. And I believe Kyle was the one that went before me, so I'll let him go after me for this one for Heim. Yeah, I gave Bloom a, a B plus um, because I think that he built a really solid team. Um, I think he kind of played his money ball strengths and was able to go out and find these guys that were just going to add a lot of value. You know, it gave, that's why I think I said a lot of 
this gave me 2013 vibes because it seemed like he kind of went out, kind of like Ben Sherrington did, was like, all right, I just got to find guys that are just going to come in, do their role well, and just try to win games for this baseball team. And that seems like exactly what he did. Um, my, I will say the only two things that don't make his grade higher are, A, I think that part of that is a little bit of luck. I think some guys are really outperforming what their expectations were, and it could end up being, you know, maybe a little lightning in the bottle, kind of like what Eduardo Nunez was in 2017, I think is when he was first added to the team, and he was, like, crazy good, and we were kind of like, oh, okay, this guy's pretty good. But, you know, obviously that was just him overperforming, or, you know, some guys, like, when when Sandy Leone was the best hitter in baseball, and you're just like, it's one of those, sometimes guys just, like, step up at a level that you can't account for. Christian Vasquez, Sean, if I can indulge you there. Christian Vasquez in 2018, like, he wasn't supposed to do that. We saw that this year. Um, and then the other thing, like you guys said before, was just the way that he, I felt like he could have, spent it a little bit more at the deadline not enough to like you know blow up the farm i didn't think this was a blow up the farm team but i think he could have done a little bit better to put them in a better position to succeed post trade deadline i believe sean is next yeah yeah i'll go um i also gave bloom an a again you know the one kind of drawback was the trade deadline in the moment i i had some very mixed emotions about the trade deadline that i won't get into but i think it is fair to say that he probably could have added more to this team but then you have to, the reason I gave him an A is you have to look at who the key players are on this roster. Kike Hernandez, guys like Hunter Renfro, Garrett Whitlock, Kyle Schwarber. Those four guys are good acquisitions. Robles, exactly. Like you've got five guys right there. Salamora was great for most of the year. Ottavino came in. The Yankees, like, like for nothing, basically. Like, plus you got Frank German as well. Like you've got, he brought in prospects. He helped bolster the farm. He drafted Marcelo Meyer um consensus like best talent in the in this draft um and he did all of that while fielding a 92 win team that was you know large by and large aided by guys, like specifically kike hernandez i think he finished second on the team in war or was the team leader in ref, uh, baseball reference war um which is kind of absurd to me that kike hernandez of all people was you know the big the like a five win guy this year that's just insane yep. you got him for Two years, 14, like, come on. Made $6 million this year, and based on the 8 mil per win above replacement method, he or equation, he was basically worth $40 million this year to yeah. the Red Sox. Which so. is insane. <laughs> uh, that's that's called banking your investment. Now we can suck next year, and it doesn't really matter. The contract was still pretty much worth it. Um, yeah, I... I Agree 100% there. Um, we can move on now to the X factors of this series specifically because obviously the Red Sox season isn't done. What about Jeremy? Or no, sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry, oh, Jeremy. Oh, For oh. some reason, I thought you already. <laughs> my bad. Go ahead. Oh, oh. Hey, what's, what's up? Now, um, so <laughs> indulge bad. me. Allow me to buckle on my boomer chin strap for a second here and say that he gets a B. The reason he gets a B is this. Um, first of all, a lot of the core of this team is already in place by the time he came here. He sold off Mookie Betts, obviously, but as we all know, he had to do that on ownership directive. He doesn't get any minus points for that. But he already had Devers. He already had Bogarts. He already had Martinez in place. Sale, albeit coming back from Tommy John, was here. Dombrowski also signed Evaldi. Those guys have been really the rock, not counting Sale, of course. You Those roster. guys have really been the rocks that you've relied on all year to get here. The trade deadline acquisitions only came here halfway through the year. I mentioned it earlier. I would have liked to have seen them get more at the trade deadline. I think it would have not only gone farther to improving the roster, it also would have helped a little bit of that clubhouse morale. Because regardless of what they'll say, I do think they were a little bit deflated after being leading the division for so long, seeing your main guy coming in being Kyle Schwarber, and then something called, again, a Hansel Robles was your top pitching pro uh, guy that came in at the deadline. It's just not enough. He needed to do more. I'm mad at ownership for not allowing him to spend over the luxury tax. If that's truly what they did, they should be ashamed for it. They're the Boston Red Sox, pony up the cash. He gets a B. He did replenish the farm system, as Sean said. I don't really care too much about that. I care about winning, and at this point, if they can go and trade some of those prospects for a guy next year if they want, so I'm, I'm happy with that. Go for it. Um, this is the make-or-break offseason for High on Bloom, and he's not going to get his grade affected by what he does off of this year, but he's got to learn at this point that he does have the Red Sox full resources behind him, and that means money. He moneyballed this year, okay. But I want to see if his philosophy to that end will continue going on into next year. And there's no precedent for it. I don't know whether or not he's going to pony up big and get one of these free agent shortstops that everyone's talking about. I don't know if he's going to go and get a starter on the uh, 
the tr the uh, free agent market next year. He could, but there's nothing to tell me that he won't go back and still nickel and dime people like he did with Tampa Bay. So I want to see what happens. That's more of a uh, a warning shot per se, not necessarily an in 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 indictment on his grade this year. I do think it's incredibly difficult to field a 90 win team while also bolstering your farm the way he did which is why i think he deserves but extra when, points but in my when opinion when you have the core in place what is it you added kike hernandez okay very good nice job but he's a utility player again a patented product of the Rays system but you had devers you had bogart you had martinez a lot of gms can come in and win a decent amount of games if you have your three four five hitters already set in your lineup like that's a big thing let's not act like it's like chump change here and too. also part of the problem why he had to why Schwarber was so hard to put in this roster was because he was a liability defensively. That is also partially on High and Bloom's doing. You could have built the roster a little bit better to actually play defense because Lord knows I got so exasperated watching this team try and field balls through the latter half of this year. And in the beginning part of the year it didn't matter. They'd mess up, but they were winning, so it was okay. But when they're losing and they can't hit, those defensive errors become that much more glaring. I will yeah. say that two key sources of defensive errors, Xander Bogarts, Raphael Devers. That's fair. That's that's not his fault. But if you're if we're gonna call those guys the rock, then we also have to say that he can't move them off. He can't move them out of off the off the off the field. And I do think it's also okay. worth noting that it's not like JD Martinez was coming off of an all world season like he did in 2018 and 2019. He was really bad last year. And I know <laughs> But you all, knew it was I mean I thought all, it was gonna be more of a fluke yeah, than anything. Like you knew that twenty twenty JD Martinez would not duplicate twenty twenty. Because that was think, so bad. <laughs> like we so did, bad. We did all peg him as a as a bounce back guy. It, I mean, if memory serves, I don't know if if Kyle did, but um, oh, let, let's also comes... revisit start of the season. I said Hunter Renfro would be the biggest bust on this team, so I just want to take my lickings on that one now. <laughs> I was wrong. I'm sorry. That's my um, bad. But anyway, J D Martinez, his numbers, and I love J D, and he really helped in that Rays series. His numbers were very much inflated by April and in, in the beginning of May. He was very average after like May 10th. He was, was not it, great. Was it you who said that his at bats are uncompetitive? I don't know if I said that. It was either I you or I did, Sean. I think I may have said two. that because there was a stretch where his at bats. That's a looked, word. Or his at bat at bats look pathetic. Non-competitive. Um. But yes. Uh. Yeah. I. I think when it comes to the Red Sox, especially, you know, you looked at the deadline. Bogarts was starting to struggle. Had that wrist injury. JD Martinez had been average for a bit. Devers was really your main source of that previous core outside of Evaldi that was really a rock all season. I know Devers for a bit struggled as well. But bringing Kyle Schwarber, as bad as he was defensively, dude was out of his mind offensively and was a big source of your offensive production for a while. And when it came to, you know, I know I wanted to trade Bobby Dahlbeck at the deadline. I very much jumped off the bandwagon with him very quickly, rather prem prematurely, which is outside of my, I think, you know, that is really not what I normally do when it comes to prospects. I like to be, you guys know, with my Nikhil Harry stance. I'm very much like, I see potential. I will allow That's him different. to struggle That's for different. a bit. There's a little bit of bias there. There's a little bit of bias We can't there. go down this road. We're going to be here forever. <laughs> but not trading Dahlbeck. Also, huge props to Bloom for that. And eh. Dahlbeck and Schwarber were two of their best hitters after the deadline. That. I mean, if they got, if they had gotten Rizzo, I understand that Dahlbeck performed better than him, but I would have liked I like Rizzo in a playoff situation. He didn't get to show it with New York, but he's a good playoff guy to have. He is also a declining first baseman that didn't hit particularly well with the Yankees, albeit probably affected a bit by the COVID issue, but also Well, he probably would have gotten it if he came here. <laughs> yeah, obviously because you know the Red Sox definitely didn't have any COVID issues post deadline. Um, also, fun fact, Bobby Dahlbeck is fourth on the Red Sox in sprint speed. Yeah, he's very fast, which is hilarious I and also even, kind of an I, issue. I was, didn't even, it never occurred to me, man. Like All the times you saw him pinch run, you weren't just like, yeah. <laughs> no, I just figured, like, you know, like because, like, your other option is, like, Danny Santana, but then you have to play Danny Santana. <laughs> yeah. The run doesn't score. <laughs> for oh, sure, for man. Sure. Well, right. I'm reaping what I sow. Pauses. <laughs> Danny Santana. <laughs> All right, so before we get into our final C series predictions, well, let's go through the X factors, and I will let Jeremy go because he said that he might take a couple minutes on his. No, we'll we him. took we took too long. My computer's absolutely exploding right now, so we really do have to get through this fast. My okay. X factor is Verdugo, Granky, Luis Garcia, Kendall Grayman, Ryan Presley. I believe are their four best pitchers in this series. They're all right-handers. 
Alex Verdugo has to lengthen out the lineup, especially if he's batting fifth behind Bogarts for that righty-lefty split. He should be able to take advantage. And the key in last year's, uh, not last year, 2018's ALCS against the Astros, outfield defense. Mookie Betts robbing the home run in right field. Ben Benintendi JBJ. with the game saver in left field. Uh, I and yeah, and JBJ was hitting bombs. Existing, cause so guess what? Just there. Outfielders got to step up again. It's a much more underwhelming outfield now. But Alex Verdugo is my X factor in this series. Mine too. Um, yeah, I, said, I, said, I sound smart because I agreed with a nerd. <laughs> yes. I said in spring training. I said in spring training that I thought that he was going to have a decent season, but overall underwhelm after the season he had last year, and I was right in that regard. But I also put him as my X factor for the Red Sox to make the World Series this year. He, they need him to be, you know, the the key piece of the return for Mookie Betts, and he was in the Rays series for much of it. Outside of Game Four, I thought he was probably outside their of every time outside he of ran any, the bases. I was about to say outside of any time That's he has true. to move. That's true. But <laughs> offensively, he was huge in those first th- three games of the series. So, um, yeah, I had Verdugo and I had Ottavino. I think he's going to have to get some big outs in this series. Whether or not we all want him to be in those positions, he's going to have to because he's got that slider and his fastball. I think is better than he gives himself credit for. Go ahead, Kyle. Um, I just want to jump in there because mine's very similar. Mine's just like the Red Sox setup guy, whoever that be. Their seventh and eighth inning guy. Who's their closer? I Whitlock, mean, probably. that I'm not super it's worried about. I don't it's about, think so. It's the guy that gets you to Whitlock because if you look back at the exactly. games that they almost lost to the Rays at home, both of those games were blown in the seventh and eighth inning because they pu- they couldn't find the guy to get them to the ninth. They need to find someone who's going to get them to the ninth inning to get you to Whitlock, to Robles, whoever that guy's going to be. Because the Astros are a much better team. And if you give them anything, they are going to take, take, and take. They're not going to score enough runs so that it's just a tie game and you can have Christian Vasquez save the day. They're going to take and they're going to beat you if you don't have a good enough setup guy. Here's why I asked whether or not Whitlock would be the closer. Is games 3, 4, and 5 in Boston are all back-to-back. Do you really expect Whitlock to work three days in a row for the first time all year? Because I don't. And I also think the core is going to use him multiple innings in one of these games. If not, I think as many as three games, he could go multiple innings. Let's say 1, 4, and 7, for simplicity's sake. You're going to need someone else to cover your back end. And Ryan someone, Brazier. <laughs> we saw that in Game Four. He gave me Yaxel a heart attack. Axel Rios. <laughs> we, can name, we can Valdez. name. We can name the wheel of gutless bums as much as we want, but somebody's going to have to step up. I completely agree with Kyle. Yeah, I also think before Sean gives his X factor, I, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. In the games they won in that 2018 LCS, did they use a reliever in the eighth inning ever? I thought it was always Joe Kelly. Maybe, maybe Joe Kelly, five. I'm pretty sure. No, no. I don't think he did right. the LCS. I think it was because I know in game two it was Porcello. In game three, one, it was oh, Evaldi. In the, in, the, in the LCS? Game three, yeah, in the LCS. And one, it was Evaldi yeah, because then series. he pitched in game three. Correct. Game, game three five, was, Price went six. Sale, no, Sale didn't pitch in that series, but I don't remember. So it may, may have been that fifth game. I think Barnes pitched the eighth inning of game. Oh, Sale, or Sale. Here, Kimbrel well, pitched well, the well Sean talks. I'm going to go find that out. I'll yeah, do go research. ahead, Sean. I'll be, I'll be the Joe Rogan boy, whatever his name is. It's a, Internet sleuth over here. Hey, can you go um, pull that up, Jamie? <laughs> yeah, pull that up, pull that up. Oh, that's his name. Thank you. <laughs> up, up, up. Um, yeah, no, I think continuing with the theme of X Factors coming out of the bullpen, I would actually go with Darwin's and Hernandez. I know Josh Taylor is going to help neutralize those lefties, but I think you need that kind of electricity, that kind of just like wild fastball that he can just blow by anyone. Specifically coming in with situations like, you know, if there's like two outs and he's got to get out Jordan or Kyle Tucker. I mean, like we saw how it happened with Stanton and Rizzo, but I think you just kind of need that extra arm out of the bullpen. And I'm a Darwin's and truther. I've always, I always have been. He struggled this year, but... If there was ever a time for him to find it, now would be the time. He had plenty of time to work because he did not pitch in the LDS, so he could definitely. He's the true Pomeranz right and now. Af- and after he got hurt, he before the Yankees implosion, he was one of the best relievers in their bullpen for like two or three weeks. So, I mean, it's possible. I just the thought of him facing Jordan Alvarez and then walking him with freaking like Correa on deck. Oh. Yeah. And not, being able, and not being able to go to a righty in that spot. Oh my goodness, it's terrifying. Okay. I have done I have done the big boy research. Um games one and four, they did not use uh starters. 
games two, three, and five, they used starters as relievers. Game five, Evaldi pitched an ending and a third, which I completely forgot about. Erod closed game two. Game one was kind of a blowout, if I remember correctly. So I literally just it looked blew at the up. In the I don't know why. They yeah. were losing late. No, but though. Heath Henry closed that game, which should tell you. And game four was the game that Kimbrel closed. He tried to go four outs, but it was after Barnes came in. So Barnes was technically. Kimbrel went six outs in that game. Did he? Did I read that he wrong? Went, yeah, he went six outs. Oh, that's outs. right. He, he had never <laughs> done it. That's right. Everyone was yeah. marveling oh. at it. Alex Cora, man. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> you, you're right. What a lunatic. Oh, God. So, Erod went a fat zero innings in this game, apparently. He gave up. Like Jonathan Holder? He had a 7.36 ERA in this game. Oh, nice. oh, he came in, gave up a walk, and then came Yeah, then out. he left. <laughs> oh, nice. my goodness. <laughs> Good. So to kind of put a bow on this, we'll do our final series predictions. I will go first. I originally had Astros in six. I think McCullers not pitching gives the Red Sox another game. Anything can happen in a game seven. I still think Houston's too good to beat. They're an absolute powerhouse. They're close enough in the rotation. They're better than you in the bullpen, better than you in the lineup. I have the Astros winning a seven with Carlos Correa winning uh, ALCS MVP. We will go to Jeremy next. Mark it down, boys. We're going to be doing another one of these preview shows in a couple of weeks because the Sox are winning in seven. And I have absolutely, once again, a patented 2018 Jeremy pick. I have no logic to base this on other than I feel really good about this team. Sean has been gloating on Twitter mercilessly for the last couple of weeks. Jordan and Kyle not far behind, and I myself am probably in last, but I've still done my fair bit of toxicity on Twitter. Uh, this team is fun. I don't want to see the ride end. Let's ride. I want I want Sox in seven and uh, ALCS MVP. I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with Schwaber. I think Schwaber's gonna go take it. Sean, I don't think Kyle's got last yet, so we'll let Sean go. There are two outcomes in this universe: Astros in seven or Red Sox in five. <laughs> <laughs> that is fair. If, Love that. If this if this team gets a whiff of momentum. In the fir- in it's, one of the first so two true. games in Houston, if they even get a a skosh, a an smidge, iota, <laughs> an iota of momentum, I think they have a serious. Ch- if they win like game two and then game three, I think it's over. I think you can put a bow on the series. I fuck that. that. I love that. Means- I absolutely okay, Paul love Pierce. That. <laughs> well let's not get carried away i don't i don't want to be throwing that around here um i think the more likely scenario is that houston pulls it out in seven um, oh come on but you wet blanketed it at the last second no i like that's that's why i said there are two just, outcomes so just which one you i would probably pick. go like i would probably go 65 35 in favor of astros and seven Come on, Kyle. Come on, Kyle. I'm kind of sad that you guys ended with me because mine's going to be like the big wet blanket. I thought I was going to get the lead on it. I think that the Astros will win this this series in either like probably five or six games. Um, I love this team. Don't get me wrong. Like I'm so far behind them. Like I love them to death. I think that I do agree with Sean. You give them a little bit of momentum. Things are going to get interesting. But just from I like I said earlier on the show. The Astros have just had the Red Sox number this entire year. And I know you have sale back. Didn't they do that but, in 2018, too? Didn't they have the Sox yes. number? They went 5-2 against the Sox in 2018. Eee. But but that was the one of the best teams to ever ever assemble in baseball. Eee. This is this is a ragtag motley crew, which, hey, might help them in the end. But the Astros have had the, Reds, have had the Sox's number all year. They're a much better team. And... I just think that they're just poised to beat this team. But the Red Sox are, who knows? They're just, let. like I said earlier, let chaos reign. Who knows Two what's going to happen? Two things before Jordan wraps this up. One, can you imagine the amount of tool baggery to come from the four of us if they somehow win this series? How absolute wild cards we will be if they win this series. And secondly... I just want to say that I think more so than 2018 for me, probably for the first time since 2013, this is about as popular as I think the Red Sox have been in town in a while. You know how loud Fenway's during, been getting? I didn't. I, we, I was there. Sean well, that's was right, there. You were there. Sean was there for game <laughs> yeah. three. I was there for game four. Jerks, I get as, the Diamondbacks. This is as wild as I've seen this fan base hey, in a I while. Had to, you know? I was supposed to go to both of those games, and I had to be quarantined in my room. Oh, <laughs> oh, brutal. Did, did you know that they pulled in a 20 rating? in uh for game four of the ALDS against the Rays 
to put that into context, the Celtics and the Bruins, a good, like a good Stanley Cup game is about a twelve. A good NBA Finals game is about a twelve. It shows you that the Red Sox fan base can still get up there in views. You because no way, no way are the Bruins pulling in a twenty in a second round game, which is the equivalent of what the Red Sox were playing. So. Take it all the way, boys, because I Baseball's need to see these falling. ratings. I, I need to see – well, let, let's not let's not go to that because I still think it's dying a little bit uh, in the national stage. But in Boston, it is once again reviving itself because this team is once again fun to watch, which is, and, as we all said, what we wanted coming into the year. Is it not? That's all we wanted, exactly. and they're doing it. And I think the reason why this team – the fans are so much more behind this team is because you had that one-game playoff against the Yankees and you won. Yeah, I mean, against Cole. Agree. Arguably one, arguably one of the most important games played in either of those teams' like franchise histories, and that might be kind of blasphemous to say, but like that's the that only is very time that, to that's say. the only time that twenty first century for sure. That's the okay, only time yes. the, these two teams have ever played where it was just like there was it's one or nothing. I know Shirley can say they played game sevens before, but there were a lot of things that went up to that. The seasons that these two teams had, the way that they were just back and forth against each other, the expectations that both suck. of them had. The history that both of them had. I said to Sean and a bunch of other people, this game was the World Series for both of these franchises this year. Both of these franchises needed to win this game, and that was it. That was their expectations at that moment were just to win that game. And the Sox I, managed to pull through. And Aaron Boone might still not get Fenway, I think. Fenway was electric. And I think that the fact that they beat the Yankees in that game after having the season that they did, the 2013 vibes, Cora's back, Guys are playing well. Blank check to Raffy Devers. Like, all that vibes. It was able to lift this team to another whole stratosphere. Plus, Christian Vasquez, walk-off home runner. You freaking kidding me. <laughs> I think with the with the comparisons that this season was getting to 1978 with the way the Yankees kind of resurrected their season, the Red Sox started to collapse after the trade deadline, tr- too. That game at Fenway was super important because it was, again, carbon copy. Bucky Dent was even in the building. Your season could have ended on the Fenway fe- on on the field at Fenway Park, and instead they pr- pretty much the Yankees went away without without a whimper outside of you know that sixth inning where Evaldi up the homer and then there was that chaos play at the plate. Um, the Red Sox basically stepped on their neck and didn't give them a chance to breathe. Um, they that that game was super important, and then obviously they they're now playing with house money and going into that series with the Astros. Anyone else have anything to add? No. Okay, so Jeremy can tell you where you can find us. I know he said that. Uh, yeah. I know he's usually the one that that lets us, lets you know, plugs all of our stuff, so he can go for it. So the graphic will be up for our normal picks episode. We're just going to do the graphic this week. You can check it out on all of the platforms, including the primetime Instagram, but Instagram, Twitter, um, TikTok at Mass with Mike's Mass Holes with Mike's on YouTube. This episode will be up, so you all get to see what Sean looks like for the first time. Um, hey, sorry, folks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we will yeah, see you guys. Out. We will see <laughs> that that would be funny. He's we first name the... last name. Seriously, um, you like we'll... modify my voice. We'll see you guys next week. Uh, we're going to make Sean look like a witness in uh, Witsec. Completely black. His voice is really, really low, a deep bass. I'm going to have fun with it. But, yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys for joining us. And, you know, hopefully the the Red Sox are able to put up a very good fight in this series and hopefully win it. I mean, obviously, you get to the World Series, you, you, you win a couple of games in, in the LCS. You know, anything can happen. Like, like Sean said, they get an ounce of momentum. They're going to run away with this thing. So, for – Go Can ahead. I close this out? Sure. <laughs> for for uh, for Kyle, Jeremy, Jordan, and Sean, this has been Mass Holes with Mikes. And boys, do we have pen and fever? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>